wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. It is a great honor for me to welcome you to the webinar series on Indonesia in Korea and Korea in Indonesia. It is the first uh, webinar and we will focus on the political development and international relation with Indonesia and Korea. This webinar is conducted collaboratively between uh, Seoul National University Asia Center and the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Indonesia. The Seoul National University Asia Center is a research and international exchange institute based in Seoul, South Korea. After launch in February 2009, Seoul National University Asia Center has pursued its mission to be a global hub of Asian studies by integrating regional and thematic studies about Asia and the world. For more information and updates, please visit snuac.snu.ac.kr. Faculty of Social and Political Science of University of Indonesia is a leading academic institution for the development and social social sciences in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. It was established in 1968 and currently hosts seven departments, namely communication, political science, criminology, sociology, anthropology, social welfare, and international relations. For more information, please visit fisip.ui.ac.id. Uh, fisip uh, now, may I invite our host to deliver, to deliver opening remarks. First, may I invite Dr. Ari Setiabudi Susilo, Dean of Faculty of Social and Political Science, University of Indonesia, to deliver his uh, opening remark. Dr. Ari, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Evi Fitriani. Good afternoon. Speakers, Dr. Jiwon Su, Hello, Dr. Ji Wonsu, and Dr. Jeremia from Universitas Indonesia. Dr. Ji Wonsu from Seoul National University. Moderate, moderator, our moderator for this uh, afternoon webinar, His Excellency Ambassador Chang Bong Kim. Hello, Ambassador. Former Korean Ambassador to Indonesia. Uh, and Dr. Su Jin Park, Director, Seoul National University Asia Center. Hello, Dr. Su Jin Park. Oh. <laughs> and participant of this webinar. Hello, all of you. Today is a great day. The image of COVID-19 pandemic. We could meet and conducted this conducted this webinar series on Indonesia in Korea and Korea in Indonesia. An interesting uh, title of this webinar. I really appreciate and support this academic collaboration. Relation between Indonesia and Korea has been very close recently in the realm of many aspects of life. In day to day practices, many Indonesians now Nowadays, already used to eat Korean food, enjoy <laughs> K-pop music, and not to mention many become fans of Korean drama in television <laughs> almost every day. In our university, we also have many students from Korea who learn Indonesian language and other subjects including politics and international relations. The number of Korean students in Universal Indonesia is the big. The, is the biggest in the biggest is the biggest number of uh, foreign students in yeah. Indonesia. Through this webinar, we hope to increase connectivity and understanding in many aspects such as economy, politics, and social cultural life. Hopefully, this webinar could meet its purpose as a mean for exchanging ideas. And of course, for the very important impact is to building academic network for future collaboration. Seoul National University has become a good partner of Universitas Indonesia. The two universities are, mem are member of Asia Pacific Research University, APRU, for more than two decades. Recently, 
our faculty member from Department of Sociology had been involved in International Consortium of Wellbeing. Other colleagues from International Relations Department frequently engage with their counterparts in Seoul National University. This webinar is a good starting collaboration between Faculty of Social and Political Sciences in Southern Asia and Seoul National University Asia Center. I would like to thank Director of Seoul National University Asia Center, Dr. Soon Jin Park, and, this, and his team to start this idea and invite us to join this collaboration. We should continue, we should continue en enhancing our cooperation and collaboration. I also would like to extend my gratitude to speakers, Dr. Si Won Su and Dr. Jeremia. Moderator, His Excellency Ambassador Chang Bong Bom Kim, and all participants in Indonesia, Korea, and other parts of the world. Thank you for your particip participation and contribution. Uh, lastly, I would like to give appreciation for the Joint Organizing Committee from Seoul National University, Asia Center, and Faculty of Social and Political Science, University of Asia, for the hard work to make this webinar series possible. I hereby open this webinar series, Korea in Indonesia and Indonesia in Korea. Have a fruitful webinar. Thank you very much, Aris Wisiolo, Dean of Faculty of Social and Political Sciences in South Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aris Susilo. Uh, is now, uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Su Jin Park, Director of Seoul National University Asia Center. Okay. Professor Thank Park, you. please. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Uh, Abby already very nicely introduced so National University Asia Center to everyone. Uh, we established about 11 years ago and uh, last, during the last 11 years, years, actually we have a very large increase uh, in number of uh, faculty members and uh, at the same time, the research funding, of course, there is a uh, lot of research output. So I mean, really uh, uh, we are hoping uh, to collaborate with the uh, universities of uh, Indonesia for the more uh, fruitful you know, collaboration between us. Uh, first, uh, actually, I would like to thank Dr. Ari Setabudi Soshilo. My pronunciation is correct? Yes, okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the dean, of course, dean of the Faculty of Social and Political Science of UI uh, for making uh, today's event possible. I also would like to thank staff members of organizing committee, uh, including Dr. Abby Pitriani. Thank uh, you. And uh, Miss Daisy Yasmin. I, I actually, I cannot find her here. And uh, Miss Paramita Utami. I mean, they are all make uh, this occasion possible uh, uh, from the Indonesian side. Uh, from Korean side, actually, Dr. Jongchul Kim, actually, he done a lot of work <laughs> to communicate uh, with you and to make uh, all this uh, webinar is possible. possible. And also, Ms. Juliana Lee and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Hyuna Che from our side work very hard uh, to work together. Actually, uh, without uh, their commitment to the successful run of the webinar series today, today's meeting may not have been possible. Uh, in addition, I would like to thank uh, to the engineers at the Universitas Indonesia, you know, someone behind us. <laughs> the IT staff, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, with their technical expertise in the running internet-based meetings. Thank you very much again. Uh, especially, I'm very grateful for His Excellency Ambassador Changbom Kim. Actually, we met uh, each other the first time today. Uh, actually, uh, I'm very grateful he is joining us as a moderator of the webinar. He has served as a Korean ambassador to Indonesia between uh, 2018 and 2020. And now he's setting up his own research institute in Seoul 
to facilitate collaboration between Indonesia and, uh, and uh, Korea. So actually, I'm very grateful he spared his very busy time to moderate today's session. I'm sure it is almost impossible to find a better candidate for presiding today's webinar. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Seoul National University has uh, made a great success by increasing its size and volume. But from this year, actually, we set up another goal uh, to become a more internationally recognized research institute. As a vehicle to achieve this goal, actually, we began to accelerate the international collaboration with a reputable academic institute abroad, like the uh, Universitas Indonesia. Uh, I'm pretty certain that the cooperation between UI and the SNU Asia Center today will be a starting point for our international collaboration with the reputable institute abroad. Uh, UI is one of the most prestigious academic institution in Southeast Asia, as far as I know. And I hope we can further extend our partnership to the research and exchange in coming years. Uh, furthermore, I hope we can reach out to other universities and institutions in Indonesia and ASEAN countries with the help of Universitas Indonesia. Right now, we, have, uh, we are having a tough time in the middle of a pandemic around the world. Nonetheless, we have made an international joint event possible with our commitment for the common goal of international cooperation. Uh, with, uh, with the diminishment of the pandemic, uh, there will be a lot of more chance we can work together. For this year, for this near future, today's webinar will work as a springboard for jumping up. Thank you again for making today's webinar possible. And thank you all audience for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Park. Uh, Dr. Epi. Now, uh, Dr. we Epi. would like to take a picture Dr. together. Uh, before I, before we take picture, can I say something to Dr. Sujin Park? Yes, yes. please. Yes. I forgot in my speech inform you that actually just last month, we in Universitas Indonesia, especially Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, established Asia also Asia Center. Asia, Asia Research Center. Center. Asia Research Center. Universitas Asia, Asia Research Center just last month. So we we uh, we can collaborate uh, uh, in the in the and near it future. It is hosted in our faculty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, at you. the Asia Center, we have a Southeast Asia Center. Yeah. And then actually two weeks ago, we set up a nation uh, research center like Vietnam. Oh. Our research center. Uh, we hope we can set up another Indonesian <laughs> Indone oh. Indonesia research center <laughs> sometime next year. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Look, yeah. I'm back to already. Tom up to to Tom. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also Dr. M. <laughs> All right. Okay. And next, before we uh before I uh give this mic to uh, our um, our moderator ambassador kim may i invite all of you for a joint photo session uh for uh maybe this is very much typical indonesia but uh, maybe it's good also as our record can you all in the panelist room uh, turn on your camera please turn on your camera and smile uh, nicely <laughs> okay uh, crystal go ahead Okay, thank you, Ma'am Effie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and honorable speakers, uh, before, we take, before we continue, uh, please take the webcam with the nice pose. Uh, on my mark, in five, four, three, two, one. Please hold it up for us. Okay. Okay, secondly, on my mark, in five, four, three, Two, one, please hold up. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mamma for the Okay. Chance. All right. Thank you. And 
Before we start our uh, discussion, may I uh, introduce you to our moderator and some of uh, information already mentioned by Professor Park, but I have a uh, quite uh, uh, complete information about him. So may I introduce Ambassador Chang Bom Kim. Uh, uh, Professor Ambassador Kim Chang Bom is a well-experienced diplomat. He's currently working as a co-founder and advisor at the newly established Center for Strategic and Cultural Studies, Korea. He has completed his diplomatic career of 20, 39 years in September 2020, so just two months ago. And he has served as Korean ambassador to Indonesia from January 2018 through July 2020. He also worked in Brussels as Korean ambassador to European Union and Belgium from 2012 through 2015. Ambassador Kim has special ties and experiences with European Union, ASEAN, and Indonesia in particular. During his career, he made significant contribution to the promotion of Korea's partnership with EU and ASEAN through summit meetings preparation and substantial progress in trade investment and people-to-people -people exchanges. He has worked together with the Indonesian government in reaching a final conclusion of Indonesia-Korea Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in November 2019. As a career foreign service officer, he has served five overseas posts and worked at various positions within the Korean government ever since he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in December 1981. He earned a master's degree from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., USA, and, and is a distinguished graduate of Seoul National University. Without further ado, may I now hand in the microphone to Ambassador Kim. Please, Ambassador Kim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ivati. Uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to be a part of uh, the team uh, uh, for this uh, webinar part one. Uh, this uh, webinar series has been uh, co-organized by uh, Seoul National University, my alma mater, and uh, Universitas uh, Indonesia, uh, an intellectual hub for uh, research and uh, the uh, academic activities, uh, especially the, uh, the leading uh, hub for Korean studies in Indonesia. And uh, I'm very delighted uh, to serve uh, this uh, first uh, webinar series as a moderator. Uh, I was quite uh, happy to uh, accept uh, an invitation instantly uh, right after uh, I was approached uh, by uh, SNU uh, for this uh, quite auspicious role. And uh, today uh, we'll be uh, uh, sharing uh, with each other the insights and foresights uh, with relation to the future uh, of our uh, bilateral partnership, especially in uh, democratic transformation and governance. And another uh, part will be on uh, foreign policy of Indonesia. Uh, we have two uh, distinguished speakers who will be uh, presenting uh, their views and their perspectives uh, for 20 minutes each. The first speaker will be Dr. So Chi Wan, uh, she will be uh, touching on uh, the democratic uh, governance uh, within uh, Indonesia, especially focused on uh, political recruitment uh, in the recent years. Uh, the title of her presentation will be The Young Witch in the House, a new trend of recruitment in Indonesian politics. Uh, Dr. So is a well-known uh, leading scholar on Indonesian affairs in Korea. She is currently uh, serving as professor of the Department of International Relations, Changwon National University. Uh, she has obtained her PhD uh, degree from Ohio State University in the United States. His, uh, her research uh, focuses on transitional justice, human rights, 
politics of identity and Southeast Asian uh, politics, including Indonesia. And the second speaker will be Dr. Aditya Edward Iremia, who is uh, a faculty member of the Department of International Relations, uh, Faculty of Social and Political Science of Universitas uh, Indonesia. He is quite well known within uh, Korean uh, scholars since he is uh, one of the uh, uh, young but promising uh, scholars uh, uh, focused on uh, Northeast Asia and uh, Korea, Indonesia foreign policy trends. His latest research is on the domestic sources of Indonesia's relations with both North and South Korea. Uh, especially focused on leadership and regime legitimacy. So uh, we uh, may not be able to find uh, much more suitable speakers who uh, can uh, share with us uh, the uh, current perspectives and uh, ideas on uh, those, both uh, domestic political scene and external uh, scenes uh, from the perspectives of both Korea and Indonesia. I think that's uh, uh, this uh, whole uh, initiative taken by both SNU and UE uh, is something uh, that deserves a lot of credits and approaches because uh, Korea and Indonesia are known to be uh, very close and getting closer to uh, Mansjati and Dan Sehati. But still, I think there's, there are more rooms uh, for both uh, uh, countries to uh, narrow down the gap in perception and understanding. So uh, I think this uh, webinar would be one of the series that might be able to fill the gap, gap uh, which is uh, not big enough, but still I think this is sizable so that, uh, the, uh, that will be uh, enabling us to uh, bridge the gap and to uh, kind of make uh, our people-to-people -people understanding uh, much uh, closer and deeper. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. So Ji Wan will be representing her perspectives on the uh, democratic uh, governance uh, within especially uh, Indonesian politics and House of Representatives. Well, uh, Dr. So, floor is yours. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Kim, for kind introduction. Uh, two disclaimers. Yeah, one is that I'm not a part of Seoul National University Asia Center. Uh, I, as uh, Ambassador Kim introduced me, I work in Changwon National University as an associate professor of international relations. Have you ever heard of Changwon? Well, if you visit Seoul, you can go to Seoul Station and take the train three hours, then uh, you can get uh, to Changwon. Changwon is one of the industrial city. My husband calls this city like the city arch of Korea. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the second disclaimer is that I did not choose this topic for myself. Uh, Seoul National University Asia Center uh, chose this topic for me. Um, and so this, the title of this webinar is Indonesia in Korea and Korea in Indonesia, but this is actually about Indonesia in Indonesia, right? Uh, well, uh, the Seoul National University Asia Center asked me to talk something about Indonesian democracy. Um, so this specific topic was given to me and well, I studied democracy and I studied Indonesian politics, but I have never wrote uh, written a piece on in, in the situation of democracy in Indonesia because it's a crowded field, right? So as a for, uh, junior scholar like me, I have specialized field which is transitional justice and human rights. So this uh, presentation is based on my online article uh, and this is not full-fledged uh, research. Um, this piece was actually intended for Korean audience and um, uh, 
as I understand, there are more Indonesian participants in this seminar, maybe, uh, than Korean ones. So maybe you're already familiar with this topic and you know maybe, uh, maybe you know better than me. Uh, please correct me when I'm wrong. Um, okay, so two disclaimers. Indonesia and Korea, uh, South Korea are two democracies, Barugude, uh, which is not very like fancy new democracy, but uh, not an established democracy. So in Indonesia, the uh, President Suharto resigned in 1998. So Indonesian democracy is uh, now it can be said like 20 plus years old. In Korea, it was 1987 that we got a new constitution based on direct presidential election. So maybe Korean democracy is middle-aged, but still young in Korean standard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we have last in common. Um, first is polarization. Recently, I bought a book on Indonesian democracy uh, published by Australian scholars. And they said they, they have so many concerns about Indonesian democracy, which actually uh, I share, but these are not like only Indonesian problems, right? Polarization of politics, uh, especially during elections, but also outside of elections is serious in Indonesia, but it is also serious in South Korea. Well, uh, usually these days I have my lunch alone. Uh, first uh, problem is, of course, the coronavirus. And second, maybe the political conversation with my colleagues. <laughs> and second is about politics. Well, uh, in Indonesia, there was this Sarasen news, which was known as a fake news website that spreads hatred against other groups, minorities. Well, uh, in Korea, we have uh, our own bot politics. Uh, this person is actually uh, our governor of Gyeongsangnam-do province. Well, she, uh, he was uh, convicted of uh, approving bot politics of a clique who tried to change online opinion, manipulate online opinion by artificially inflating the number of likes given to comments supporting the oh. current president um, um, against the uh, rival candidate An Chol Su. So it existed uh, in 1917, um, and also it also existed in 1912 and uh, 2012. Sorry, 2017 and 2012. So, uh, but politics is also a problem in Korean politics. Limits to free speech and limits to uh, freedom of association also exist in Korea as well as in Indonesia. Um, yeah, well, the scholars uh, indicate that the ban of uh, Hizbut Tahir in 2017, right, uh, was, um, it shows that Indonesian democracy is limited because it limits the freedom of association. But in Korea also, uh, we don't allow all the political parties and civil society organizations to exist. For example, um, this guy is named Isoki. Uh, he was a National Assembly member, Angota DPR, um, and his party was disbanded in 2004 because uh, he, in a recorded file, sound file, um, they, oh, sorry, they found out that it, this person incited a rebellion in the South uh, in the event of a war against North Korea. So this party was sort of Pro North Korea Party, and the government asked uh, the Constitutional Court to review um, uh, whether this party should exist or not. And this party was eventually um, uh, disbanded uh, in 2004, and then he was arrested and sentenced to nine years in jail. So we don't allow like everything. Law enforcement politicization was indicated as a serious problem of Indonesian democracy by uh, the, the Australian scholar Thomas Power. Well, in South Korea, the most popular presidential candidate now is Jaksa Agung, 
the the uh, prosecutor general. And everybody talks about prosecutors and prosecutor general. Um, yeah, I know more about uh, prosecutors and what they write on SNS rather than, for example, national assembly members or party politicians. So now in, in South Korea, law enforcement is very much politicized. Um, Australian nostalgia in Indonesia, yeah, it exists a bit, like about 10%, right? Uh, support uh, authoritarian regimes, but in uh, South Korea also, uh, there are uh, some people who support or prefer authoritarian uh, regimes, and there was this uh, nostalgia strong enough to get uh, Miss Park geun the daughter of the former dictator uh, Park Jong hee elected to president in 2012, uh, although she is now uh, jailed. Um, yeah, Tommy Suharto of Partai Porcaria is still very unpopular, um, no, as always. <laughs> so I think, yeah, there is some nostalgia, but like 10% of voters uh, who have a little bit of nostalgia is not very threatening uh, to democracy. So I think maybe one uh, aspect of uh, Indonesian small democracy that can be compared and contrasted with the situation in Korea is dynasty politics. Because mm. in Korea uh, also we had a um, serious debate about what is fairness because uh, in 2020, so several months ago, this the person in the, on the left is a former National Assembly Speaker, Kutua uh, Depeer. Uh, of uh, South Korea. His name is Moon Hee Sang and his son, actually this guy is already like 50 years old. But anyway, he tried to inherit the uh, electoral district of his father and uh, put forward himself as a um, candidate. And he failed because there was so much opposition you know, from the public against his candidacy. Uh, is electoral district uh, something like private property? So people asked, and he had to uh, resign uh, himself. Um, in contrast, <laughs> in Indonesia, uh, the son of uh, the current president, uh, Jokowi, uh, Mr. Gibran, put forward himself as a, a successful uh, candidate of um, solo mayor election, the upcoming election in Solo. And his candidacy is actually, uh, as you all know very well, a bit different from um, the political, I should say, success of Megawati or Puan because he was not a member of the PDIP for three years. So it was against the, uh, the internal rule of the PDIP uh, party. So the man on the right, uh, FX Rodi, who was a, who is the head of the PDIP solo chapter, sort of argued against uh, Gibran's candidacy. Um, so he uh, challenged uh, dynasty politics from the perspective of party politics. But um, eventually, even Megawati endorsed Gibran's uh, candidacy and. Uh, also, President Jokowi endorsed it, and now FX Rudy also is prepared to um, make the make, make him win as a um, solo mayor. Uh, so there is renewed uh, interest in dynastic politics, which may be euphemism of nepotism. Uh, in Indonesian politics, on the left, there is a I think. This um, scholar is an expert. Uh, maybe he's, I don't know him personally, maybe, maybe he's uh, writing on the dynastic politics. And the, uh, the article on the right is my um, magazine article, online magazine article that I published with the Seoul National University Asia Center back in um, September. So uh, the well, maybe the, and there are, it's not only Gibran, there are many other uh, candidates who are 
who have very influential family members uh, and who are running as candidates of uh, the regional elections, like um, Maruf, uh, Vice President Maruf Amin's daughter, and also um, President Djokovic's son-in-law, Babina Sution, and also um, Bravo Osnis, Saraswati, Joyo Hatikosumo, many, many others. Well, not all of them directly inherit the district of their parents or uh, family members, uh, but they sort of make use of the names and also resources of their very influential family members uh, in the elections. And I wanted to link the aspect of dynastic politics to youth politics because now uh, across the countries in uh, the world, there is a re also a renewed interest in uh, youth politics. This is a um, website of, I think, NED, National Endowment for Democracy. And many people are uh, have are interested in the role that uh, young people can play uh, in politics and international relations, where millennials are actually in a world millennials and the generation uh, younger than millennials are actually excluded from many economic opportunities that the generation of their parents cherished. And of course, Indonesia is a country uh, very well known for the tradition of youth politics. Um, everybody knows that uh, back in 1928, there was the uh, youth pledge that gave birth to uh, the nation of Indonesia. And there is also a um, revolution. There was the in, the in the national revolution of Indonesia against the Netherlands uh, back in uh, 1945, 1946. Also, uh, the young people played a very important role um, in making also uh, former President Sukarno declare independence and everything after that. 1998, uh, there was this protest politics uh, that made a very critical juncture in Indonesian politics. And uh, this, these are the protesters who uh, want to <laughs> disband the um, uh, legislatures of um, uh, Indonesia. I think maybe some of the participants of this uh, seminar were there as a protester. Um, this is the a picture I took back in February uh, 2019 when I visited Menteng. Um, so in 2019 election, general election, there were uh, many young candidates um, from this uh, Partai Solidaritas Indonesia, but also from other parties. Well, the PSI uh, was uh, well known for placing many young candidates, but they failed to overcome the 4% uh, threshold right in uh, the election. Uh, although they uh, have some seats in Jakarta uh, Council, so there are many, uh, but there are still some young candidates who were uh, successful with elections. So I gathered, collected the profiles of 10 youngest DPR members, 10 youngest National Assembly uh, members um, who were under 26 when they first got elected and entered the um, Parliament, the DPR. Uh, so the, uh, the the youngest ones, Hilary Brigitta Lasso, is, she's from Nasdem, uh, graduated from Universitas Belita Harapan in uh, Indonesia. She uh, got elected in North Sulawesi. Both of her parents are Bupati of the uh, province. Uh, and the second, Farah Putri Nakhlia, uh, is from Ban. She graduated from a Brit, uh, university in Britain. She got elected in West Java. Her father is a high ranking police officer. And there were um, other male uh, candidates who turned out to be successful. Muhammad Rahul is from Gurindra. Uh, he was elected in Riau and his father was a, a DPR member. Uh, 
uh, in the previous term. And his uncle is a very well-known, famous or notorious uh, politician of <laughs> apartheid Democrat, Muhammad Nasaruddin. And uh, Fakri Pahlevi Kongo Asa uh, is from Ban. Uh, he uh, got elected in Southeast, oh, sorry, Sulawesi. His father is also Bupati. Arkanata Akram is from Na uh, Nasdem, uh, born in 1994. He's from this university, Universitas uh, Indonesia. He got elected in North Kalimantan, where his uh, own father is now uh, an incumbent governor. And uh, Rizki Aulia Rahman Natakusuma, he's uh, from Partai Democrat. He also got um, graduated from a university, I think, in Britain. And his father was a MPR deputy speaker. Adrian Jopi Paruntu is from Golka. Uh, his father was also Bupati. Putri Komarudin is the daughter of a very uh, well known former DPR speaker. Ade Komarudin. Uh, she graduated from a university in Australia. Uh, Bramantio Subondo uh, is from Gurindra, and his father is not a politician, but former banker. Dia Ruru SD uh, was uh, elected in East Java. She uh, graduated from University of Manchester, and his father was former DPR member. So it's, it's not the youth politics itself is not a new phenomenon in Indonesia. Well, in Korea, we we'll just uh, respect our elders, and <laughs> so youth doesn't know anything. But in Indonesian politics, there were politicians who got elected and started very successful career when they were like very young in their mid twenties. Uh, One is uh, Ibu Kofifa. Um, she got elected to the PR as a, a Petiga member, I think, back in when she was. 26 or 27. And Father Lison also uh, started his uh, career uh, at a very um, early stage uh, in uh, when he was very young, like middle of, uh, he was 26 or 27 and he got elected to uh, MPR, I think, Majalis Bosnbar Mushawaratan Republic. So the youth politics is uh, not a new phenomenon in Indonesia, uh, both in protest politics uh, and electoral politics. But uh, it is very interesting to see that all 10 members have very, pri very much privileged family backgrounds. Eight out of 10 have politician father uh, who were regional head or DPR member. And there was this perception that female politicians, especially Bupatis, the district heads or mayors, uh, uh, inherit the, the province from their wife's husband or father. So the dynastic politics is a female matter. It's not true. Both female and male members are uh, from political families. So it's not limited to female members. And they were elected across the regions, four from Sulawesi and Kalimantan, but there were also um, uh, they are members from West Java, Central Java, East Java, Banten, and Riau. So this is an Indonesian, pan-Indonesian um, phenomenon. And they were also um, uh, endorsed by different political parties, three Goka, two Gurindra, two Nasdem, two Pan, and one Democrat. So it's not limited to some one or two parties. And their median West is, I'm sorry, I'm very bad at... Um, I don't know, <laughs> reading the big numbers <laughs> in English. But does it really matter the median uh, reported wealth when you can provide a uh, nickel um, or nickel mine? I think it was risky. Uh. Riskiaulia? No, I'm sorry. Uh, one of them, uh, Fakri, yeah, Fakri. Mr. Fakri uh, have uh, limited wealth according to the reported wealth, but uh, his family provided a nickel mine uh, to the uh, family of um, his wife as Mahar. So very uh, rich family. Um, and the majority were educated overseas. So the uh, five have a BA degrees from overseas, two unknown, and three SATU, three university degrees from Indonesia. 
And so the, these are representatives of Indonesian people who have not been living in Indonesia as a grown up. Some of them went to international schools in Singapore or in uh, Indonesia for secondary education. Uh, one never went to any Indonesian school. Uh, the, uh, Ms. Dia, Ibu Dia Roro SD, she went to Beijing International School for a primary education and then moved to uh, uh, other countries and then came back as a DPR member uh, to the country of origin. And politics is family business rather than partisan business because one, you, know, you can see that one can uh, easily belong to a political party different from their fathers. So it's a uh, um, family-based business uh, centered on uh, perhaps campaign teams rather than political party machinery. And I think this uh, trend of recruitment shows the increasing role of the rich in Indonesian politics and how they make shortcuts um, into politics. So for example, Abriza Bakri spent lots of resources maybe to get elected as the um, uh, head of his party or car. Um, but now uh, the rich doesn't even bother to um, get themselves elected as a head of political parties. The political parties belong to party politicians but they um, just fund their candidacy like Santiago Ono did when uh, he was matched with uh, Anis Baswedan in Jakarta gubernatorial election. Um, he, was, he didn't have much experience in politics, right? But he um, uh, is now um, very well known, one of the most well-known politicians in Indonesia. Uh, other people didn't even have to uh, spend their resources on their for their candidacy. For example, uh, Mr. Eric Tohir, uh, it was a part of the Joko, President Jokowi's campaign team, and now he is the Minister of Public Enterprises, State Enterprises, uh, in Indonesia, and he is also uh, one of the promising presidential candidates of the next election. He, I saw his name in the list of um, the survey questions, and also. Nadine Makarim, uh, he uh, is now a minister of education and didn't, uh, when he didn't, I don't know, did he ask it <laughs> to president or not? So, uh, well, back in 2014, President Jokowi said um, there will be experts in his um, cabinet and professionals in his cabinet rather than party politicians. And now we can see that the, the experts and professionals are CEOs and very rich CEOs for that. And the next slide shows the millennial advisors to President Jokowi, uh, whom he appointed uh, last year, I think in October, I know in November. Um, so he had uh, 14 special advisors and seven of them were uh, from the millennial generation. And there are one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. Hmm. I also collected profiles of millennial advisors to Jokowi. Uh, interestingly, most of them uh, used the uh, word CEO to describe themselves. So they founded some company or um, foundation. Um, only one was not a CEO of anything. He was from a uh, president of MEE, Indonesian Islamic Student Movement, so more traditional path to politics, uh, maybe, but all others uh, were um, CEOs. Uh, mostly they were educated in Indonesia for the bachelor's degree, but they also had a second, uh, the graduate school degrees uh, in USA and um, ANU Oxford and President Jokowi actually only emphasized the graduate degrees of the uh, millennial advisors uh, when he introduced the millennial advisors to the public. So this is it. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the last, last, last slide, I'm sorry. Uh, the young rich phenomena and tentative implications, only tentative implications for Indonesian democracy. Well, Indonesia is known as a country of egalitarian nationalism, right? 
and I strongly agree with the Dan Slater's um, statement in 2012, uh, uh, 2020. And uh, I, when I gave the, the assignment of comparing Indonesia and other countries, and uh, I asked my students, undergraduate students, why uh, to write on why Indonesia uh, is a successful democracy. And they said Indonesia is a democratic country because pres some, somebody like President Jokowi, who is of humble origin, can become a president. Uh, so they uh, respected Indonesia for that. And now, I don't know, the, the pattern of recruitment, political recruitment is not going to the re that direction. So I uh, say more data and comparison and thoughts are necessary for conclusive arguments. But uh, my conclusions are first, Indonesian democracy is well alive with serious competition between candidates. Money rules because electoral competition is very fierce and peacefully fierce. Um, but if this trend of politics as family business intensifies, only oligarchs would rule, and they wouldn't bother to rule indirectly by recruiting and funding others like professors or UE or lawyers or NGO workers. Um, and modern democracy means uh, universal suffrage, equal voting rights. But what if voters can choose only among the rich 1%? I mean, there are other people who, ask, who would ask, like, is elite politics better and better? Should the graduates of SNU and UE become a, a legislators instead of rich people? What is it? Is it fair? But yeah, we need to think about that. But I think, yeah, it's a bit worrying. And uh, in the theory of democracy, there is a tension to women's representation in new democracies, right? So we have uh, both countries have quota. What about young representatives or underprivileged representatives? Like, uh, unlike in social democracy, we don't have um, a group of uh, I don't know who have uh, who are of humble origins who become of successful uh, politicians. And I could see that uh, most of the um, here only one and three was. Uh, chosen as a millennial advisor. So maybe if there are ambitious medical elites out there, and if they want to become a successful uh, politician, maybe the only alternative for them is to get some position in mass Islamic organizations, right? Okay, so that's all for now. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. So I think this uh... Uh, the whole presentation is uh, well illustrating some of the uh, political trends um, uh, now underlying the uh, whole uh, democratic uh, governance uh, within Indonesia. Uh, she has uh, posed up some stimulating questions. Uh, one is, of course, this uh, whether this young rich or young uh, elite in uh, political uh, recruitment is a very new, brand new phenomenon in Indonesia, or uh, that has uh, remained uh, in the political scene, uh, even uh, during the new order uh, regime. And the second uh, kind of uh, question might arise that whether uh, Indonesia's case is really a unique one, in Southeast Asia, it might be uh, uh, true in other countries within Southeast Asia, even in South Asia, like Sri Lanka, India. And the third question that I might uh, uh, raise uh, with regard to the presentation uh, by Dr. So is that whether this trend it's a young, rich or young uh, uh, family-based, uh, uh, dynasty-based uh, recruitment uh, is a really a tendency on the rise or more or less uh, uh, reflecting uh, the current uh, domestic climate. Or we may see a lot more in the local election to be held in December this year. So those are the things that uh, we might uh, 
uh, come up with uh, when uh, we uh, will be uh, diving in uh, into this question. And also, I think it's quite useful to have the comparison between uh, Indonesia and Korea uh, in uh, those uh, political kind of uh, uh, transformation or the landscape uh, that we are now faced with. And uh, we will have Q&A session later on after uh, the second speaker will be completing uh, his presentation. So let's move on to uh, the second uh, presentation uh, titled Motives and Interest of Indonesia's Foreign Policy Toward Korea. Uh, Dr. Yeremia, are you ready, Sudashya? Yes, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to speak. And it is truly an honor to speak in front of uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Korea and Indonesia, especially in front of His Excellency Ambassador Kim. I believe that uh, the pressure is quite high because I will present something that you must know about it. <laughs> so like Dr. So, uh, please also uh, correct me if uh, somehow I make uh, uh, mistakes on this uh, presentations. But uh, for Dr. So, I really enjoy your presentations. It is very good to hear um, uh, uh, external perspective on Indonesian politics because sometimes Indonesians cannot really see the details and wait until the external observers identify it, and then we realize that this is something interesting to uh, to observe in the in the near future. So I will, in my presentations, I will present uh, major highlights uh, uh, in Indonesia's relations with Seoul. Uh, actually, my approach is a bit uh, a historical approach. I'm uh, I completed this research uh, because. Uh, uh, because uh, East Asia Institute invited me to uh, make a, a chapter on Indonesia's uh, the triangular relations between Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, Seoul, and Pyongyang, and I developed this this chapter with my uh, colleague, actually uh, Muhammad Arif, he is also with the IR department, uh, 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 Universitas Indonesia. So I will begin uh, by describing a bit the historical background of uh, Indonesia uh, relations with uh, South Korea. So in 1949, after Indonesia gained uh, 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 Dutch recognition for its independence, the nation started to expand its foreign relations. However, at that time, I argue that South Korea as well as North Korea were not immediately, in, were not immediately on the Indonesian government's radar. So I will argue that uh, Jakarta's uh, attitude towards uh, both North and South Korea was quite indifferent at the time. Uh, uh, for example, uh, both North and South Korea were not uh, represented in Jakarta hosted Bandung Conference of 1955. However, after they had come into more frequent contacts, uh, Jakarta uh, developed relations with uh, Seoul and Jakarta also developed relations with Pyongyang, it should be noted that Jakarta uh, tried to keep uh, relatively equal distance between uh, Seoul and, uh, and Pyongyang. However, as far as Indonesia's relations with South uh, Korea is concerned, a bitter, a bitter enmity actually arose uh, because of uh, President Singh Manri's open support for an armed uh, 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 an you know an armed insurgent groups uh, challenge towards uh, Sukarno central government uh, 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 authority. However, uh, when uh, 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 Park Chung Hee's regime uh, assumed uh, power, uh, Park Chung Hee's attempted to uh, woo President Sukarno, try to persuade President Sukarno, convince him to develop uh, closer relations with with South Korea by offering some economic uh, cooperation opportunities. And President Sukarno actually sent a very positive signal about that and promised some uh, economic cooperation to, uh, to develop in the near future. However, it should be noted in the early 1960s, from early to mid 1960s, Indonesia also uh, uh, have a very uh, particularly close 
uh, relations uh, with Pyongyang. I would say it's a very special relations between uh, President Sukarno and uh, 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 Kim Il-sung uh, at that time. However, it should be also noted that Jakarta in fact tried to uh, uh, convince Seoul that uh, Jakarta want to establish a consular office in Seoul in 1964. And uh, an economic mission was also sent to Seoul and uh, Kotra office is in, uh, was in fact uh, established in November 1964. So uh, despite uh, Jakarta's particularly close relations with uh, Pyongyang, Jakarta still uh, have you know an interest to also uh, uh, keep its close relations with uh, Seoul. However, due to the Halstein uh, doctrine at that time, uh, uh, uphold uh, very strictly by uh, Park Chung his regime, meaning that um, if a nations have a diplomatic relations with uh, North Korea, they cannot have a, a diplomatic relations with uh, South Korea as well. Uh, however, then um, uh, Seoul ask Jakarta to abandon its diplomatic relations with North, Co North Korea first before establishing uh, 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 diplomatic relations with South Korea. It's, it was quite impossible for Jakarta at, at that time because uh, Jakarta, uh, Indonesia actually was being isolated internationally and North Korea was among a very few countries that provided a open support for Indonesia's confrontative foreign policy uh, uh, Indonesia at that time, uh, you know, uh, 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 launched this uh, confrontacy, uh, a small uh, intensity uh, military campaign uh, against Malaysia. Uh, at that time, only North Korea and China provided uh, strong support for Indonesia. So it, it was quite impossible to abandon uh, relations with uh, North Korea at that time. Uh, however, the situations then changed after uh, uh, after 1965 when uh, president uh, uh, president sukarno uh, have to face a very difficult so, uh, situations uh, domestically that led to the rise of president suharto if we observe the early development of jakarta uh, uh, soul relations after the abortive coup uh, october 1st 1965 so we can uh, uh, we can see that economic was the main concern of both uh, Jakarta and Seoul. From, for example, from, uh, from 1966, 1967 to 1970s, for example, I found a very good archive telling me that at least six delegations traveled to Jakarta from Seoul discussing about how both countries can promote uh, bilateral and economic operations. And even in 1968, only uh, only two years after Jakarta, uh, you know, started to contact, uh, to establish contact again with Seoul, Indonesia's export to South Korea were six times larger uh, than, the, than in the previous years. And I get the sense that uh, Indonesia's relations with uh, South Korea was also, uh, were also shaped by the context of Cold War at the time, because of Indonesia's uh, somehow, uh, 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 Indonesia's inclinations to grow closer, uh, more uh, closer relations with the West at that time, and then uh, uh, the U.S. provided the the aid to con uh, for Indonesia to construct its first highway, and the U.S. Uh, uh, you know particularly told uh, Jakarta that only companies from U.S. allies that can construct uh, your first highway, and. In 1964, uh, Hyundai Construction Co. was awarded a construction contra uh, con uh, contract to build Indonesia's first highway. We, we call it uh, uh, Jagorawi, that connects Jakarta with uh, its satellite uh, city, Bogor. Yeah. So there is there was a sense of uh, you know uh, Indonesia-South Korea relations at that time was benefited from uh, Indonesia's also uh, uh, close relations. Uh, uh, with the West. And I also observed that during uh, uh, President Suharto's era, there were some main economic operation sectors, uh, for example, uh, for example, energy. Uh, Indonesia was, uh, I believe it was until 2007 that Indonesia was uh, the largest uh, uh, provider for LNG to, uh, to South Korea. And the, the cooperations uh, begin in 1980s, 
and it was also a very important cooperation at that time because when Indonesia established uh, 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 energy explorations cooperations uh, with South Korea, Indonesia eventually diversified it, its partner because before South Korea came in, Indonesia only uh, have strong uh, energy cooperations with Japan. So it's quite a positive uh, development at that time because Indonesia always want to diversify its, its partner. That's, that's uh, for me, that's uh, one of a very fundamental characteristic of Indonesian for, uh, foreign policy. If Indonesia can, uh, uh, can expand its partner, so it's better for, uh, for Indonesia rather, have, rather than only keep one very close uh, partner. There were also uh, economic operations in the forestry sector, plantations, constructions, and a very important as well is in, in uh, manufacturing industry, uh, South, uh, South Korean uh, manufacturing companies uh, uh, became interested in investing Indonesia in uh, the late 1980s. Uh, this was created a new pattern uh, of investment in Indonesia because before, South Korean uh, 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 companies particularly focus on the uh, uh, extractive industries uh, and the forestry. But after 1980s, uh, in the late 1980s, there was a shift. Then they, be uh, they became uh, more focused on exploring a manufacturing sector as well. However, in early 1990s, 1990, uh, 1993 onwards, uh, there was a rising labor cost in Indonesia. Indonesia lost its competitive advantage to uh, China and Vietnam. And this largely explained the decline of South Korean investment in Indonesia before an another decline due to the uh, 1997 Asian financial crisis. Yeah. Um, and then uh, as far as Jakarta's uh, political relations with uh, Seoul, uh, I also found the data that it was only after 1974 that Jakarta agreed to establish full uh, diplomatic relations. So in fact, it took almost eight years after 1966, if we, if we, if we agree that Jakarta ended its confrontasi with Malaysia in 1966-67, then uh, Seoul in fact ha ha had to wait uh, another eight years to establish full diplomatic relations with uh, Jakarta. It is also interesting to note that Although uh, Sukarno abandoning, uh, 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 although you know Jakarta uh, stopped the uh, stopped the confrontasi, Jakarta did not end its diplomatic relations with Pyongyang, unlike with uh, Beijing. Uh, following 1967, uh, uh, Jakarta fr uh, freezed. We call it uh, in Indonesia uh, dibekukan. So we suspend our diplomatic relations with China, but. In, uh, as far as uh, with uh, North Korea is concerned, uh, Indonesia never uh, uh, suspend its diplomatic relations with, uh, uh, with North Korea. It is also important to note that the early development of Indonesia-South Korea diplomatic relationships were, uh, was heavily shaped by a very strong military-to-military -military, uh, relations because uh, both uh, President Suharto's regime and Park Chung-hee's regime were a military-backed regime. But it is also very important to uh, uh, note that uh, Indonesia-South Korea partnership at that time uh, uh, was not transformed into a military-driven uh, military partnership. But the relationship was uh, 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 manifested mainly in a, an economic partnership because both regimes were particularly concerned on how to provide economic development because economic development was their main uh, uh, source of uh, legitimacy, their, their, their main uh, uh, source to, uh, pro, uh, to sustain their, uh, uh, their regime. And during President Suharto time, uh, it is interesting to see that uh, President uh, Jakarta was quite reluctant uh, when Seoul asked to support uh, asked Jakarta to support uh, South Korea uh, uh, applications for the membership of the non-aligned movement. On the other hand, Jakarta provide uh, an open support for Pyongyang's applications at the time. And uh, uh, 
uh, this 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 development then provide Pyongyang uh, uh, with the only you know uh, so then the non-aligned movement was the only platform for Jakarta and Pyongyang to interact outside the bilateral mechanism. On the other hand, especially following the uh, uh, the fall of President Suharto. Jakarta Seoul's relations uh, expanded with so many uh, mechanisms to facilitate uh, bilateral interactions. Uh, and also uh, 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 Jakarta and Seoul also uh, the member of some multi uh, multilateral forums. So they, they have uh, more, uh, 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 more forums to, to interact uh, with each other. And post-reformacy era, after the fall of President Suharto, interestingly, Seoul was not in President Wahid uh, radar at that time. President Wahid uh, was known for his famous strategy of playing the Asia card. He believed that if Indonesia can strengthen its link with uh, uh, China and India, and also Singapore and Japan, then Indonesia will uh, have a very much better positions in international uh, uh, relations. However, he didn't mention uh, uh, South Korea. I didn't do a deep research on this uh, to explain why. He, he has no particular he had no particular interest in South Korea. However, after his presidency came Megawati's presidency and Megawati, uh, Pres uh, President Megawati presidency play a very important role in, in trying to mediate uh, North and South Korea. Uh, President uh, Megawati was the is the daughter of the first president Sukarno. Of course, North Korea uh, regime uh, 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 acknowledge her uh, for her you know, uh, important positions as a, a Sukarno daughter and had also an high expectations to uh, uh, mediate uh, talks between uh, uh, South and North and South Korea. And President Ma uh, Megawati also did a very important uh, 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 work to foster economic ties with Seoul, especially after the 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis. And, as far as Indonesia's relations with uh, Pyongyang, President Megawati also support and welcome the admissions of North Korea into the Asian uh, 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 Regional Forum. So under President Yudhoyono, this is actually the, the very uh, important time for Indonesia-South uh, Korea relations because Indonesia was also on the rise at the time, I, uh, I argue. Indonesia uh, uh, also uh, be, became the member of G20. APEC, ASEAN plus uh, ADM and plus, and Indonesia initiated this uh, democracy forum. And through this forum, Indonesia can easily interact with, uh, the Indonesian leader can easily interact with the South Korean leaders at the time. And even in the 2010 uh, Bali Democracy Forum, I believe uh, President Yudhoyono co-chaired the forum with uh, President uh, Lee Myung-bak. Yeah. And also, it was also during uh, Yudhoyono's presidency that uh, Indonesia was also uh, have a cooperation with South Korea in establishing MICTA, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, uh, Tur uh, Turkey, and Australia, a caucus of middle powers. And it, it only provides another venue for Indonesian and South Korean leaders, uh, officials as well, to, to interact with each other. So it's a, it's a very strong foundation of relations, I believe, because uh, I believe that if 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 the uh, if if you can increase the interactions, then you can uh, uh, you can minimize the possibility of misunderstanding, and and also to uh, manage the uh, manage the relations better. Yudhoyono's presidency also uh, saw the expansion of uh, bilateral uh, trade, and South Korea's F uh, FDI Indonesia, and he also uh, began to cooperate. Uh, uh, to strengthen the strategic relations by, uh, for example, establishing, establishing the cooperations to produce uh, military weapons, uh, submarines, yeah, and then uh, starting to uh, also the joint development of, uh, of an advanced uh, fighter aircraft. So I believe during Yudhoyono's presidency, uh, Indonesia, South Korea is not only about multilateral diplomacy, economic ties, but also uh, another domain was also a, a, a developing and came Jokowi's presidency. It's a very important case in Indonesia-South Korea relations as Ibu Efe mentions, uh, Ambassador Kim, <laughs> I believe play also a major role in this uh, negotiations. And it's a very good study case for international relations uh, scholars, Ambassador, because uh, it is quite 
interesting to see how Jakarta suspended the negotiation. Yeah, there was a, an issue at the time, but when the willingness came, it can be completed only in eight months. So Indonesia-Korea, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement was the fastest comprehensive economic partnership agreement that Indonesia had completed with its uh, 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 a trading partner. So I believe it has something to do with President Jokowi's uh, uh, emphasis on economic development, President Jokowi's uh, focus on how to attract uh, foreign investment to support Indonesia's economic development uh, during his uh, uh, presidency. So my presentations uh, uh, mainly discuss about uh, the historical evolutions of Indonesia-South Korea relations. Then I try to identify some factors that, in my opinion, shape uh, Jakarta's policy towards Seoul. The first one is uh, political pragmatism. Uh, uh, it's a very important one, uh, and it's uh, uh, it's really evident in, in uh, both President Sukarno's and President Suharto's uh, presidency, because uh, Jakarta at that time was uh, uh, quite very pragma uh, uh, pragmatic politically. Uh, it cannot abandon its relations with uh, Pyongyang. That's why it, it, it abandoned the, the opportunity to uh, establish closer relations with uh, Seoul, because all, uh, Pyongyang uh, and China at that time provided the support for his main, uh, for President Sukarno mains foreign policy uh, adventurism, if I may say. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, President Suharto also, uh, you know, uh, President Suharto put aside sole request to immediately establish uh, full diplomatic relations at the time. President Suharto said, I only want to focus on economy, so please wait. <laughs> and then uh, we have to wait for another eight years after, uh, before uh, Jakarta and Seoul uh, can establish its full diplomatic relation. Leaders' personality. I believe uh, Indonesia's relations uh, uh, with South Korea benefit a lot from President Yudhoyono's uh, international visions. President uh, Yudhoyono, a strong emphasis on how Indonesia should be a uh, leader, should be acknowledged. Indonesia should play more international leadership. That's why President Yudhoyono was very uh, was particularly active in promoting uh, multilateral diplomacy. So I think it uh, provides a positive contribution to uh, 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 the development of Indonesia-South Korea relations. What I'm trying to say is somehow in Indonesia, to, uh, uh, we also have to count on leaders' visions as well to, to exploit better opportunities for both countries' uh, 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 relations. And uh, the last factors that I want to highlight is the economic, uh, domestic economic imperatives, because South Korea will always be, uh, it is quite uh, interesting to see that South Korea was, uh, has been uh, very consistent, uh, started in 1967 up until now, it always in the top 10 list of foreign direct investment, uh, investor in uh, Indonesia. So economic motives will, uh, will always be one of the main strong, uh, 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 you know, something that can force Indonesia-South uh, Korea uh, relations. So, and the most important thing to highlight as, uh, another important thing to highlight as well is the element of economic complementarities because uh, South Korea came with uh, investment, uh, especially in manufacturing industries, provide, uh, provide uh, you know, create jobs opportunities for Indonesian people. And South Korea also need uh, energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, oil, uh, uh, gas, oil, and uh, uh, energy, fossil fuel energy for its own development. So somehow uh, it can complement uh, with uh, each other. On that note, so I want to argue that domestic imperatives should not be overlooked in understanding Jakarta's policy towards all. It, uh, largely ex uh, explain the the pace, the dynamics, the patterns of on of how Jakarta see and approach uh, Seoul, and with Indonesia's and South Korea continuing to pursue their aspirations for economic development, there always be a stronger motive for them to strengthen their ties, especially under the current leadership, when it seems that economy is everything. 
Dr. So must understand this because uh, her focus is also in transitional justice, observing uh, the development on how the current regime uh, uh, focus on, on, uh, on the other issue except than economics, then I will say that I am agree that the, the, the development is worrying. <laughs> Only a little note on that. <laughs> and then South Korea is uh, attractive to Indonesia as Jakarta seeks to diversify its strategic partners because uh, Indonesia, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's a very principle for Indonesian foreign policy conduct then that Indonesia doesn't want to be uh, 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 close the door, doesn't want to close the door to the opportunities to cooperate with, with other partners then South Korea, I think, will always find a place in Indonesia's uh, for, uh, foreign policy uh, portfolio. And uh, lastly, the, the important, the most important one, Indonesia and South Korea seems to have more modalities. Yeah, uh, I believe. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, this uh, to expand their interactions. Yeah, because Indonesia and South Korea. Uh, has various channels yeah, that facilitate both people to interact with each other. Yeah. We welcome South Korean students here. We learn about South Korean culture. South Korean students who can speak Indonesia tells, uh, tell, tell their, their friends about Indonesia. We, uh, if you follow the development in YouTube, we have uh, two or three a very famous YouTube influencers. South Korean people even can speak Japanese even can speak Indonesia, even can uh, cook Indonesian food, promote Indonesian culture there. And then we cannot find a similar uh, development, for example, Indonesia and China. I, as a, as a also, uh, you know, focus on Indonesia-China relations, I never see similar development. And, and it's quite important. Uh, it's a very strong modalities for Indonesia uh, and South Korea to move forward because it has a very strong foundations on people-to-people -people exchange. I think on that note, I conclude my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Iremia. I think that you have uh, covered uh, the whole array of uh, bilateral uh, relations between Indonesia and Korea, especially from the historical and chronological perspective. And also, I think you have uh, highlighted some of prominent features that are characterizing uh, the direction of uh, each administration, each government, especially on the part of Indonesia, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, South Korea. I think thank you so much for warm encouraging remarks uh, at the end of uh, your presentation about uh, uh, a bit promising and brighter uh, future uh, ahead, uh, especially uh, taking into account some of uh, people to people uh, exchanges and uh, soft power related uh, uh, the mutual uh, uh, charms are uh, uh, now being felt uh, between the two uh, uh, countries, especially uh, within millennials uh, and young millennials. I think that's uh, something that are uh, uh, quite uh, appreciated uh, by uh, both uh, governments. I think there's uh, maybe I will uh, toss up some questions for you uh, later on, but I think there's uh, uh, we have to uh, stick to uh, the timeline first. Uh, we have about uh, 30 to 35 minutes to go uh, before uh, concluding uh, this webinar. Uh, let me first uh, uh, check uh, the uh, Question that had already been uh, uh, uploaded. Uh, I think there's uh, there's a uh, uh, one. Uh, sorry. One question is already uh, uploaded, and from uh, Dr. Nuru Aya. I think there's uh, mm, the question uh, is directed to uh, Dr. Song. Uh, let me read. Uh, I have two questions. First, as you mentioned, the young politicians in South Korea is rather uncommon. Could you please elaborate on this issue, why this is the case in South Korea? And second question is, what Indonesia can learn from South Korea's 
experiences or democratic uh, kind of process. Please, uh, Dr. So. Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, well, I will first answer to Dr. Noor Aisha's questions. Dr. Noor Aisha, I, I think, actually hired me to do this presentation on this topic, right? On this very, not very diplomatic topic. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, I, I will um, use the slide again for a minute. So it is true that these days there were uh, very few young politicians in Korea. It was not actually always like that. Uh, back into uh, I think back in 1990s there were very young, not like in their twenties, but uh, leaders of student movements under the dictatorship uh, were very successful um, with electoral politics when they were in their thirties. And so we called them three, eight, six. So these people were in their thirties in terms of age, and they went to colleges uh, in the 1980s and um, things like that. And they were born in the 1960s. And these people just got older and didn't give the positions to new politicians of my generation. <laughs> and then my generation was skipped. And uh, uh, in the general election of this year, there were uh, concerns that um, we need more young politicians. So uh, some uh, political parties uh, chose to put forward young candidates, usually females, because they, it's better to fill the women's quota with young people also. And so these are um, some young politicians in the current legislature, National Assembly, uh, the ones who um, say uh, rep they represent uh, workers or the um, people of diversity. Uh, and this, uh, also this young politician's agenda is basic income. So I don't know, like young progressive, female politics. Mm, so maybe this, so the problem of the lack of young politicians in Korea is partly Confucian tradition, I don't know. But it's also uh, the timing of democratization and how the uh, generational politics turns out after uh, democratization. For example, in Indonesian politics is also the same minister from 20 years ago, right? Uh, Mr. Viranto maybe just retired, but he has been there for almost two decades, right? Um, and the second question, uh, the uh, what Indonesians can learn from Korean politics? Well, I'm not an expert of Korean <laughs> politics. Uh, maybe this can be your um, next uh, research agenda. I think every democracy has its own problems and it's not like Korea is the big sister or big brother who can teach Indonesia about the democracy, I don't think. So Korea has its own problems, uh, as I mentioned um, when I started my presentation. So I would approach um, this, the problems of Indonesian democracy in Indonesian terms, not in Korean terms. I think, I don't know, maybe what Indonesia needs should be strong anti-corruption drive because as long as um, uh, politics remains to be a lucrative business, many families would um, and many rich people would want to enter politics. Uh, but what we see from Indonesia is um, very different. Many people blame the, the open list uh, PR system as the culprit between the rise of dynastic politics. And I agree, but we cannot, I don't know, do anything about that when uh, the constitutional court um, actually decided uh, for the system. Another solution may be uh, I don't know, the internal politics of political parties. Uh, back in February, uh, Ibu Megawati said uh, in 2024 um, general election, 
the politicians need not force their children uh, to make themselves candidates, right? Uh, this would be last time she said in 2000, <laughs> this year, she said, this would be my last time to give chances to uh, the Anna, Anna or um, the E3 uh, of the, the incumbent, right? Uh, the people in the political parties, party politicians should regard the young politicians as their children. And yeah, it should be the past, uh, maybe Indonesians uh, should go to, uh, if they, if Indonesians think this is a problem, the young rich phenomenon is problem, well, back in 1998, 1999, there were strong, like Sayap Pomuda, youth swings of uh, political parties. But now uh, we don't see much of that. And it is the youth polit. Well, if, uh, if there is no strong uh, youth branch, youth swing of political parties, actually, um, young politicians who are handpicked by influential politicians uh, may be worse than rich politicians who have their own resources, right? So I think um, political parties should, and their, the youth wing should be strengthened uh, if the, this problem, this phenomenon is regarded as a, a problematic Mm, phenomenon. Should I answer the uh, questions delivered by Ambassador Kim after, right after my presentation? Uh, I think uh, uh, we have several more questions. Uh, okay. So I think that's uh, uh, maybe uh, later on, if uh, time allowed, then we could okay. uh, do that because I think there's uh, we have uh, quite a number of questions uh, now. So uh, uh, I think that's uh, uh, first. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fitriani, I think there's, uh, she has uh, something in mind, uh, especially I think that's uh, uh, sparked up uh, by uh, Dr. Sir's uh, presentation. So please, uh, Dr. Fitriani. Thank you, Ambassador sure. Kim. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, maybe your question is more important than mine. Maybe, I mean, if Dr. Su can then uh, answer uh, Ambassador Kim's question and then you can answer mine. My question is very simple. I just ask, uh, when you explain about the uh, young politician in Indonesian politics, you also include uh, those like Eric Tohir and also who is this minister, uh, minister of Education? Uh, forgot now my minister. But I mean, they are, I, in my opinion, they are not politician. They are uh, technocrats. Uh, so, uh, and this is very different uh, from like Puan Maharani, and I'm surprised because you didn't mention Puan Maharani. Uh, he's one of, she's one of very good example of polit dynasty politics, yeah. And so uh, this is this is what just only one one clarification. Like. Another one is maybe I just push this to one of the chat in the in in the Zoom that. Uh, you better not use the terminology of Indon because this is quite uh, humiliating for Indonesia and Indonesia don't like it very much. Uh, so uh, you change it to Indonesia or if it's too long, just use IR, uh, RI, Republic Indonesia, R RI, the initial. It's much, much uh, better because Indon have another very bad and negative connotation. That's it, thank you. Uh, so, uh... Dr. So, you'd like to respond to Dr. Fitriani's question? Uh, make it uh, very brief. Uh, I do have several other questions uh, to go, so please. Okay, yeah. Well, I mix several stuff. Sorry for the, uh, I think, sorry for the my use of uh, the, the Indon and I will not repeat it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I was um, in a hurry last night. And about the, the Eric Tohir and Nadim Makari, who are actually technocrats and not politicians. Yeah, I actually mixed the politicians, like the PR members and the millennial advisors and also uh, ministers of the government. But uh, maybe uh, 
so from the, from the uh, list of ministers, we can see that the, the positions which were um, actually uh, designated for technocrats who have, uh, I don't know, high expertise are now going to rich people. For example, I don't know. Uh, Maybe they are both rich and uh, have also expertise, but yeah. <laughs> They're privileged, aren't yeah. they? <laughs> yeah, maybe both. Well, yeah. Maharani, yeah, uh, well, uh, Ibu Mega said that unlike other candidates, my daughter uh, was very successful because she was smart and very capable of uh, <laughs> doing politics. That's actually what she said uh, in the speech in February this year. Well, I just wanted to separate the phenomena of the high dynastic politics of like, I don't know, uh, Indian National Congress and Bede Ipe, uh, um, Indonesia from the uh, smaller family businesses that are rising these days. So I did not uh, include Bua Maharani in this presentation, but she is in my uh, magazine article, online magazine article in uh, SNU. Thank you for the questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. So. And then uh, the next question will be uh, going to Dr. Yeremia. Uh, it is from uh, Q&A menu. Uh, uh, Dr. Epa Latifa from UE. Uh, she uh, is a bit curious about cultural aspects uh, in uh, bilateral relations between Indonesia and Korea. I think there's uh, increasingly, I think uh, in the recent years, I think we could feel a uh, soft power impact uh, upon uh, bilateral partnership, especially on people to people understanding. And how uh, does uh, cultural aspect or cultural uh, factors, uh, cultural closeness uh, affect whether cement or to uh, uh, loosen up the diplomatic uh, networks, uh, cohesiveness, and uh, growing uh, closeness uh, between the two countries. That is uh, to uh, Dr. Yeremi. Thank you, Amb Ambassador Kim. Actually, I do not want to pretend that I uh, have a very deep research on this uh, uh, Korea-Indonesia cultural relationship and uh, uh, partnership especially regarding the questions how uh, Koreans uh, perceive Indonesia. Uh, I also study uh, Indonesia-China perception, Indonesia perception of China, for example, and I'm, I in fact, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is you really need a very sophisticated method methodology to really find out how South Korean perceptions about Indonesia, and, uh, and I don't want to make a very general statement on, on this. Uh, I, I, I want to avoid uh, misleading you guys, uh, but um, what I'm trying to say is Indonesia-South Korea cultural partnership, the best of it is uh, there is the dimensions that um, generated from the grassroots as well. Not the, so the initiative is not only from the state level. That's, the, that's a very good thing in my, in my perspective. So it's very good to connect people so then the initiative could also come from the grassroots uh, level. So if, if, if Ibu Eva asks, uh, uh, is there any specific from Seoul or Indonesia's government how to, how to navigate Indonesia, uh, uh, Seoul, uh, Jaka uh, Jakarta Seoul cultural partnership? Okay, it's good to have a plan uh, initiated by the government, but for me, it's also good to have the other, this dimension that that can be uh, uh, generated from the people level. And if I may say something on the development on cultural partnership, uh, I believe that uh, we have seen an increased interactions between uh, Indonesia and South Korea. The mobility is also increasing. Uh, uh, both sides mobility is also increasing. But the challenge is how this intensified interaction could be transformed into a mutual understanding. That's why it's a very good opportunity for us to have this kind of platforms for exchanging views. 
uh, from Dr. So I, I can learn how South Korean uh, observe Indonesian's uh, domestic politics. And Dr. So I think make a very fair um, observation, for example, when she said that it's not a South Korean position, uh, we are not in a position to teach Indonesia how to develop its democracy, for example. For me, that's a very, an honest academic uh, uh, observation. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and then we are waiting for, uh, I believe uh, colleagues in Seoul are also waiting for Indonesians to also observe South Korean politics and then exchanging their views. That's why mutual understanding can uh, follow after this kind of uh, uh, platform. So I, I, I do believe that the challenge will be how we can manage uh, 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 more interactions, how we can transform uh, intensified interactions into mutual understanding. That's why if, uh, uh, if, uh, if we can strengthen these connections, if we can facilitate more interactions, I, I do believe that Indonesia, South Korea uh, in, the, in the near future will have strong foundations to uh, develop its relations uh, uh, forward. And I also have an interesting case study. I, I, I do uh, research right now comparing Chinese funded coal fired power plants and South uh, Korea funded coal, fa uh, coal fired power plants. And I did visit the, the, the field uh, in Serang. Uh, uh, actually the, the, the uh, South uh, uh, Korean funded power plants will be initiated uh, not, not so long uh, from now, but Chinese funded uh, is already in operations. And I try to see the impacts on the society. So when, for example, when I ask the uh, uh, society surrounding this Chinese funded coal fire plants. Well, you make a public protest near the, uh, near the South Korean uh, uh, funded power plants, but not in front of uh, Chinese funded uh, coal fire plants. Their, their, their answer is quite simple because it will be useless if you demonstrate in front of Chinese uh, 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 funded coal fired plants because the Chinese government will never listen to you. They do have hope that the South Korean governments or South Korean NGOs or South Korean academics yeah, uh, have another alternative views on, on the case. For me, there's a very dynamic dimensions of people to people relations that will be uh, this, uh, the, the most important part of Indonesia, South Korea relations because you can you you can uh, you can uh, you know you can somehow disagree with your own governments but you can have uh, connections between peoples there so this kind of the, the dimensions you cannot find it in uh, Indonesia China relations for example <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you do, you do not talk to authoritarian regime right <laughs> because it's it it, uh, it will be <laughs> useless anyway but it's good to have this kind of dynamic. So I do believe in the near future that the people components of Indonesia-South Korea relations will be uh, particularly important. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yeremi. I think that's, uh, uh, we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, before uh, ending uh, our discussion. So there is another uh, question, uh, again, uh, directed to Dr. Yeremia. Uh, it's uh, from Dr. Om Eun Hee from SNU. Uh, this, uh, well, uh, she is curious about the position or policy uh, of uh, President Jokowi's second term on the Korean Peninsula issue. Uh, President Okoye has been uh, rather uh, engaged in uh, Korean Peninsula security issues uh, during his first term. Uh, of course, this uh, under COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation, uh, domestic priorities uh, are so overwhelming, so it's quite difficult for President Okoye to uh, have any uh, dedicated uh, uh, efforts on energies uh, put uh, into uh, the Korean Peninsula issue, but uh, do you have any comments or the uh, ideas of, of what uh, President Jokowi's second term will be uh, 
uh, uh, on this uh, Korean Peninsula issue. Dr. Irina, make it uh, very brief. <laughs> Okay, if we observe the evolutions of Indonesia's stance on uh, Korean peace process, uh, President Megawati has uh, had the strongest uh, modalities. Uh, he can visit both sides and then talk with North Korean leaders. But unfortunately, her role uh, was uh, quite limit, uh, limited. President Yudhoyono, for example, he, he really want to exploit uh, his position as uh, 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 Indonesian president with international vision at that time, and also once tried to uh, to mediate uh, the peace process. He wanted to visit uh, Pyongyang, but following public protests uh, in the in 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 Jakarta at that time, saying that uh, why you want visit uh, North Korea? You said uh, democracy and human rights is the most important uh, element of Indonesia of Indonesian politics. But why you want to visit the authoritarian regime? Only because of this uh, domestic political dynamics that he refrained himself to from uh, visiting uh, North Korea, and then we never heard uh, from him anymore about how Indonesia can play uh, roles in uh, Korean uh, peace process. I believe the the, the same constraints uh, uh, we we will see the same uh, dynamic under President Jokowi because, as you uh, uh, rightly highlight uh, rightly highlighted that. Um, this presidency, the main focus is uh, economy and how uh, in the first term that we also hear a lot of promise about the promotions of human rights, democracy, but uh, unfortunately um, society also has to wait uh, uh, the, the improvement on this sector. And I don't think so, uh, President Jokowi will, uh, uh, my own uh, opinion, it's not, uh, Jakarta's opinion or uh, whatever foreign policy elite circles opinion. So uh, in, in my opinion, it's uh, the, the, the chance uh, is slim for President Jokowi to play some role. Even ASEAN has to wait. <laughs> Even ASEAN has to wait. A president, uh, ASEAN has to convince President Jokowi that ASEAN does, uh, does matter. So yeah, uh, that's quite unfortunate, I think, because we have the historical role, but eventually Singapore has the stage with the meeting of President Trump and uh, uh, South Korean presidents. I think that's my Thank you. Uh, observation. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Dr. So, I think there's, uh, uh, if you have any uh, further uh, comments or the some responses that uh, you'd like to share with us, uh, please do so. Uh. Hey, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and uh, precious information for uh, Dr. Arditya, because I'm actually working on a manuscript uh, which is under review uh, about the um, uh, North Korea human rights campaign in Indonesia. Uh. And I am very nervous. What if this is rejected? <laughs> <laughs> I have another manuscript right now. I'm working on, on Indonesia-Korea culture exchange. And as a wow. political scientist, I'm actually <laughs> having very uh, big difficulty in you know, um, doing research on uh, pop culture. And anyway, um, well, yes, I what I wanted to emphasize with this presentation with my, my uh, few tables were the nepotism or dynastic politics had existed for a long time in uh, Indonesia, but it was, I think, one of the multiple paths of political uh, recruitment. So uh, President Suharto made his daughter as a Minister of Social Affairs back in 1998, but there are also uh, bureaucrats uh, and also leaders of social organizations um, who could become you know, uh, successful politicians. And if we look at the um, governors of West Central and East Java, uh, Red One Kamil, Ganjar Prano, Oko, FIFA, they are also uh, or not from like this uh, dynastic background. So uh, we should see what will happen in Indonesian politics because the young politicians, the 10 people that uh, are in my table have not shown their full potential, right? So maybe, um, I don't know, maybe they will not be so successful after decades and maybe other uh, 
capable people like uh, Ibu Ibu Papa Papa the UI <laughs> uh, will become successful politicians. But it is true that uh, there are now few opportunities for um, people who are less capable of self-funding the campaigns, right? Um, so I think this uh, aspect is one of the um, flaws that uh, Indonesian democracy and also democracies of other countries like the Philippines uh, show, right? Um, so I think maybe I and other researchers should give more attention to the inequality and democracy and how uh, it will have impact on the future of democracy. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to discuss Indonesian politics with distinguished scholars like uh, Ibu Evi Fitriani and also Ba Arditya and other people. Thank you very much. So when will Dr. Su visit visit UI? Ah, uh, <laughs> after research. this COVID, I will fly to Depok, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. See so, you. Uh, thank you, Dr. So. Thank you so much for being with us. And then uh, we'll be uh, hoping uh, to see you again. Uh, and uh, Dr. Yeremia, uh, you may have some uh, final words uh, before uh, being wrapped up. Yeah. Uh, one of my research focus is also uh, people to people exchange. Uh, so far, uh, if, if we compare uh, South Korea, Japan, and China, I also focus on how people to people exchange uh, performed between Indonesia and those three East Asian countries. I think uh, South, South Korea's modality is now uh, growing and expanding, but still uh, the challenge will be how we can uh, 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 we can transform the the, the increased interactions into uh, uh, the promotions of uh, mutual understanding. That's why some work must be done. And I hope with this uh, webinar we can start and play our part right in promoting the relations between uh, Indonesia and and South Korea. Thank you for inviting me as well to this very exciting <laughs> webinar and it's very important I, I do believe and I look forward to also jo uh, also participate in the, uh, another series of this webinar. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yeremia. It's uh, really uh, uh, great to have you uh, as the uh, speaker and then uh, you have uh, covered the whole uh, uh, range of uh, issues uh, throughout the whole uh, decades of partnership between Indonesia and Korea. Uh, before uh, making a uh, kind of final kind of wrap up uh, comment, uh, there is one uh, question, and it's a big question, but it is uh, posed by one uh, the Pa uh, Arif Rahman uh, Arido, but uh, it's more on economic uh, side of. Uh, bilateral cooperation. So I think that on behalf of uh, those two speakers, let me just uh, briefly respond to that question. I think it's uh, how significant will uh, Korea's investment and Korea's economic uh, partnership influence Indonesian business uh, climate, uh, especially uh, Indonesian uh, business landscape is very heavily dependent on uh, Chinese products and services uh, and also how uh, the uh, market share and the economic uh, uh, gravity will change uh, with that uh, advance of uh, the advancement of Indonesia-Korea economic partnership. Uh, that uh, is the essence of the question. I think that's a quite uh, legitimate one. I think that's uh, with that uh, Indonesia-Korea economic uh, partnership uh, growing uh, much stronger, especially with that uh, Indonesia-Korea comprehensive uh, the economic uh, partnership agreement, uh, ITAC, part, which uh, hopefully will be taken into effect early next year, then uh, we will have a much broader and deeper uh, basis uh, for both uh, business communities to work on. So uh, hopefully uh, cushioning off the heavy independence on uh, other uh, major uh, trading partners uh, influences uh, and then also uh, Indonesia's uh, uh, market access uh, to Korea, uh, more uh, experts uh, on toward, uh, Korean market uh, will be uh, broadened, hopefully, 
and also uh, the uh, items and products uh, will be a uh, more diverse point uh, from uh, now. So uh, we do expect that uh, these type of uh, growing and stronger business partnership uh, will be also uh, leading us to uh, greater and more strategic bonds of uh, cooperation between the two countries. So uh, I think that uh, we have covered uh, every uh, question that we have uh, collected from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, joining us. I think that even uh, in the audience, we have uh, quite an uh, outstanding uh, guest, uh, Papa uh, Dubes uh, Yuri Tamlin, uh, who used to uh, serve as Indonesian ambassador to the UK and the European Union. I think he, he has returned back uh, to Jakarta. I think this. I cannot see uh, his face, but I think that uh, we have uh, quite uh, a number of. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, audiences uh, who have uh, participated into this webinar, uh, even though it's uh, uh, from uh, from the screen. And uh, I once again uh, extend uh, my warmest appreciation uh, to the two speakers who have excellently covered uh, both uh, political and uh, diplomatic aspects of our bilateral partnership. And uh, I think that there are some questions uh, I think uh, uh, emerged uh, that emerged out of our discussions uh, that might be hopefully uh, dealt with by uh, scholars uh, and researchers uh, in the uh, near future. Maybe uh, some of the topics might be uh, in need of uh, quite deeper. Uh, joint collaboration uh, based uh, studies uh, between uh, Indonesian and Korean uh, researchers. I think that's uh, SNU and UI and perhaps uh, Tsanghua National University uh, might uh, work together uh, for some specific uh, uh, questions that uh, we have uh, faced with uh, uh, during uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm truly uh, happy to announce that uh, this uh, first part of the webinar uh, has been well conducted uh, thanks to uh, this enthusiastic and uh, diligent uh, efforts of the, all the staff and organizers who have uh, gone through all the details. Uh, actually, this, uh, we have uh, had quite lengthy discussion and try out and coordination meeting yesterday. <laughs> so I think that's uh, the technically it's uh, seamless. So uh, I do uh, uh, appreciate all the people who have uh, worked behind uh, this screen. Uh, so uh, uh, let us uh, give warm support to all the uh, participants and speakers and the organizing committee. Uh, Madda. <laughs> And uh, uh, before uh, uh, closing it down, uh, let me just uh, share with you uh, some uh, administ administrative uh, notice. Uh, today's webinar is uh, part one, the first uh, part of the event. So the next webinar, the part two, uh, Indonesia in Korea and Korea in Indonesia webinar, will be uh, scheduled to be held at the same time. I mean that uh, 1530 uh, in Seoul time, in Korea Standard time, and 1331, 30 p.m. Uh, in uh, Jakarta uh, time, 26 November. Uh, now is a uh, flyer is on the screen, 26 November, the second part of uh, webinar uh, that are uh, covering three uh, topics. Uh, Indonesia's governance uh, to COVID-19 crisis uh, that uh, will be covered by Dr. Chi Lee from SNU and K-pop and fandom. I think it's uh, quite uh, an attractive topic uh, as community of practices uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Enda Triastuti uh, from Indonesia. 
And the third one, uh, Indonesian highly skilled migrants in South Korea will be covered by uh, Dr. Nur Aisha, uh, my friend is, uh, she was here to play from SNU Asia Center. So uh, we are looking forward to welcoming everyone again back on November 26th. So uh, I think this, uh, we'll be delighted to welcome you uh, on uh, November 26th. So please uh, join the webinar uh, part two uh, on uh, November 26th. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, terima kasih banyak. I think this, uh, saya uh, senang sekali bertemu uh, dengan teman-teman uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, di, uh, khususnya di, uh, dari Universitas Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, sampai bertemu kembali. Uh, I uh, hope to see you again. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Kim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Xu Yere, thank you. And other participant, uh, Dr. M, Dr. Choi, Dr. Lee, thank you also, Mbak Aisyah. Thank you, yeah. Else, 